Well, good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to uh, update um, on the status of uh, wildfires here in the state of California. We'll update the total uh, number of new transmitted cases of COVID-19 and uh, walk you through a few things we're doing uh, with unemployment insurance here in the state of California and a little bit of focus on homelessness today. Just briefly, uh, let me go over where we are as it relates to this historic wildfire season. Uh, this is a slide many of you are very familiar with, 2019. Year to date, we experienced about 5,300 fires here in the state of California, impacting 157,000 acres. You can see uh, the year to date stats here in the state. Uh, we have increased the total number of fires from 5,300 to close to 8,000 fires that we have experienced year to date in the state, 3.6 million acres now burned, 157,000 acres this time last year, 3.6 million acres year to date. Still struggling with 27 major fires and complexes, uh, and tragically, 23,000 people uh, continue to be evacuated from their homes. 19,000 firefighters uh, from all across this state and across this nation uh, are working 24-7 uh, uh, to address these wildfires. So 2,400 engines as part of our mutual aid system uh, that are deployed. 26 people tragically have lost their lives uh, and 6,400 structures have been destroyed. Uh, again, I caution everybody on these numbers. Uh, the 26 fatalities and the 6,400 structures are based upon what we have uh, seen, uh, what we have witnessed, but by no stretch of the imagination do we think uh, this tells the entire story. As we get back in uh, and people are able to repopulate, go back into their communities, uh, we'll determine more structure loss. By the way, that's destroyed not damaged structures. Uh, that number would be substantially higher uh, if you included uh, the number of structures that have actually been impacted directly by these wildfires. But sadly, 26 people have lost their lives to date. I want to focus on, of those 27 active fires, six fires, one that's very familiar to many of you, the August complex, which is the largest fire uh, in terms of total acres burned in California history. The last time I presented this to you, you saw some 817,000 acres that were destroyed in this complex, 30% containment. We've made some modest improvement in containment uh, over the last number of days, 34% versus 30% contained. And you'll see the acreage has grown, but modestly compared to seeing some of the growth we had seen over the course of the last few weeks, some 800 and 46,000 acres now burned in California's largest wildfire uh, complex in state history. Uh, the number five uh, largest complex uh, in history is the Northern Complex. This is in the Plumas and Lassen counties. Last week you saw 36% uh, containment, uh, 233, or rather 273,000 acres uh, that had been burned uh, in this, again, the fifth largest uh, complex in California's history. In this last week, 64% containment from 36%, and you can see the acres burned uh, has grown uh, modestly from 700 and, or rather, uh, to 294,000 acres. The Creek Fire, where I visited Senator Harris uh, a week or so ago, now the seventh largest. Uh, fire in California history, primarily a federal fire, but uh, impacting parts of the state uh, and our responsibility area. This is an incident command shared with the U.S. Forest Service and CAL FIRE, primarily in the Fresno, Madera counties. 18 percent containment, 220,000 acres. Last week, you'll see uh, we've made some stubborn, very stubborn, uh, wildfire complex, but we've made some progress, 27 percent containment from 18, uh, 278 thousand acres burned. Uh, I wanted to highlight just a few other fires that have gotten a lot of attention, and deservingly so. The Bobcat Fire in L.A. County was at 3 percent containment, 44,000 acres burned uh, when we last updated you, uh, 15 percent today. But you could see more than doubling total number of acreage uh, that have been lost in this fire, 105,000 acres uh, now being impacted. So we're putting as many resources as we possibly can on that fire. Again, our mutual aid system 
uh, that exists within the state of California and outside the state of California. Some 15 uh, mutual aid uh, states are helping either the National Guard or CAL FIRE directly, uh, and we're putting all the resources we possibly can uh, on all of these complexes, but focusing, as we should, uh, on that Bobcat fire as well as the El Dorado fire, uh, which we made some progress last week, 60% uh, containment on that fire, 18,000 acres, uh, but this fire uh, continues to be stubborn. As you can see, we've gone backwards just modestly in terms of total percentage contained, and you can see uh, increase of about 5,000 acres over the last week. So between uh, the Bobcat and the El Dorado uh, fire, obviously stubborn fires, uh, impactful, uh, and we continue uh, to do our best to address those uh, complexes and those wildfires. The snow fire as well, I just wanted to offer. This is a fire that we didn't update last week, but it's one we're monitoring. I wanted to share it with you last week. We're about 5% containment, 4,000 acres. Looks relatively small compared to some of these other complexes, but it's a fire of concern and one, again, of focus. Uh, today, we are making progress. Over the weekend, we were able to substantially increase the containment uh, by multiples now, close to 40% contained, 38% contained. Uh, but you're still seeing some stubbornness and growth of total acres uh, involved in that fire. Now some 6,000 acres have been uh, burned. So those are the six that uh, we have been focused uh, on disproportionately. Uh, we, of course, continue uh, our efforts throughout these other large complexes, but now five of the top ten uh, most impacted wildfires in our state's history uh, are continuing to burn, though, with real progress on some of those larger complexes, not just the August, but the LMU complex, the SCU complex, uh, where we're seeing real containment on that CZU complex as well out there in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Mountains area. And again, that's testament to the extraordinary men and women, CAL FIRE, and the mutual aid system of support. I wanted to update you now uh, on where we are with our case numbers as it relates to COVID. Uh, you can see here on the seven-day average, we've averaged some 3,400 cases. Uh, we're down modestly uh, with the latest report, uh, 3,294 cases uh, as part of this report. And by the way, those 3,294 cases uh, are off a total number of tests of roughly just shy of 150,000 tests that were conducted. And as a consequence of a substantial increase over the last few days of number of tests conducted, close to 170,000 on Friday, 180,000 uh, roughly on Saturday, roughly 150,000 on Sunday, you could see the seven-day average of daily tests now moving back up uh, to where we were uh, pre these wildfires. Again, that heat dome, the heat wave, the wildfires, air quality, were impacting our total uh, testing availability in the state. We're starting to see those numbers go back up now, just shy of 124,000 tests, average number of daily tests over the last seven days. What is very encouraging is you can see that positivity rate, some 3.1% over a 14-day period, 2.8% over a seven-day period. So, Testing now increasing, positivity rates continue to decrease in the state of California. I mentioned this uh, the last time I updated you, uh, that we're making real progress on building out this uh, very large lab uh, where we will substantially increase our testing uh, well above the 124,000 uh, average daily tests you see reflected in the last seven days. Uh, we are on uh, on schedule in terms of those efforts. And again, it's just a point of emphasis that we are committed to increasing testing in the state of California. We're not retreating from our testing responsibilities, quite the contrary. Uh, we are of the firm opinion uh, that the sooner uh, we are able to move forward to increase the availability and the timeliness of tests here in the state of California, we will have more clarity and more assurance in our capacity to move more swiftly to not only reopen different sectors of our economy more fully, but also reopen our schools uh, in a more sustainable way as well. And so uh, one cannot uh, let up 
on those efforts. And again, California uh, prides itself on its commitment uh, to advance our testing uh, in a substantially more comprehensive manner, more of a framework of equity, a focus on reaching out to underserved communities, and time frame to getting test results back uh, within 24 hours. And I should just note uh, the backlog now in terms of testing results has substantially declined over the course of the last number of weeks. Uh, just shy of 70 percent of the tests now are coming back within a 24-hour period uh, and substantial number uh, within 48 hours. We'll monitor that, uh, but we want to see those test results back within uh, that 24-hour uh, period as a benchmark, uh, as a foundational principle, uh, but again, continuing to provide access uh, and to provide the kind of quality uh, surveys that we, all of us in this case, deserve uh, continues to be our goal. A goal as well is to see hospitalizations decline in this state, 23 percent decrease now over a two-week period. This uh, slide is becoming very, very familiar and again, very, very encouraging slide. Hospitalization numbers declining uh, at a relatively consistent rate over the course of not just the last two weeks, but even beyond three uh, or four weeks. Tracking consistently uh, with those declines and hospitalizations or the ICU admissions here in the state, tracking uh, roughly similarly 25 percent decrease in the total number of ICU admissions over a 14-day period. So real progress as it relates to our case counts, real progress as it relates to our positivity rate here in the state of California. Remind you, 2.8 percent seven-day positivity here in the state of California. Testing starting to increase back up, a commitment uh, over the course of the next number of weeks to substantially increase still our testing to provide points of access to our schools uh, and more broadly to target underserved communities in the state of California. So we have a real sense of the community spread, particularly as we move into the fall, we move into flu season, uh, and we move in uh, to a challenging environment where uh, we could potentially experience what some refer to as a twindemic uh, of flu and COVID overwhelming the ICUs and hospitals. We want to avoid that. I'll be talking in the next few days about how you can help aid and advance that by getting a flu shot. Uh, but today, I, I just wanted to update you on some of these efforts uh, that Dr. Galley and his team have been advancing uh, as it relates to the uh, mitigation, the spread and transmission rate of COVID-19. By the way, Dr. Galley, tomorrow uh, will update you uh, on our tiered status. Uh, I know many counties are anticipating uh, moving into orange status, some into red, um, and some uh, that are right on the cusp. Uh, I'll reserve uh, further commentary on this except to say that data is being collected in real time. Uh, it would be premature for me at this moment uh, to, uh, uh, well, to announce uh, what Dr. Galley will announce tomorrow as it relates to the progress in these tiered status, but every Tuesday, I remind you, every Tuesday, Dr. Galley will be making updates uh, on our tiered colored status, and we anticipate as we're seeing progress and decline in admissions, in hospitals, positivity rates beginning to decline, uh, that we'll continue to see progress into those tiers uh, and a very thoughtful, judicious, uh, modified strategy of reopening. Economy, uh, will be advanced accordingly. Uh, so will the likelihood of more waivers being supported uh, for uh, our younger cohort of students and progress uh, towards getting people back in in-person education, making sure that not only the kids are safe, but our paraprofessionals and our teachers are safe as a foundational principle of advancing that cause. Speaking of causes, uh, we have not let up on our commitment to the cause of doing everything in our power to address the issue of homelessness here in the state of California. Last week, I updated you and I previewed that I will continue to update you on our efforts on this remarkable initiative called Project uh, Home Key. I say remarkable because there's simply not a state in America that's committed to this kind of capital infusion to purchase motels and provide uh, for permanent supports of housing uh, for homeless individuals. 
Last week, we updated you on some $76.6 million uh, that we're providing for seven specific projects uh, here in the state of California to advance that cause. Today, we're announcing the second round of awards. Uh, and again, this is happening in historically short period of time, and it shows a resolve and a commitment, a sincerity of effort and a long-term strategy to address homelessness in the state in a way the state of California has never done in the past. I again, I stipulate that we have a moral and ethical obligation to address this issue head on. We need to see better results at the local level and the regional level, and we need to make sure your tax dollars are going for their intended purposes, and that's to produce real permanent results. That's foundational in the home key strategies. This second round of awards is testament the hard work of our team and our task force that is organized around the principle of a housing first model. Again, shelters solve sleep. Housing and supportive services, we believe, begins to more substantively and permanently address homelessness. $236 million, some 1,810 units, 20 projects in 12 jurisdictions, including one Native American tribe that are getting this now second tranche of awards. Uh, we have those uh, reflected here on two slides, this being the first of the two slides, giving you a sense of the totality of awards that we are providing. Uh, the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians be the first tribal award uh, that we provided under this program. We want to thank them for their partnership. We hope it's not the last in terms of availing resources to our tribal uh, nations. Accordingly, uh, we are diversifying the home key efforts, focus on farm workers, focus on LGBTQ youth, our seniors. You can see here uh, the diversity of municipalities and localities getting the benefits of these awards, including the city of Mountain View, doubling the number of available beds through this award in that city. Oakland, two large projects, 163 units, in Fresno and their housing authority uh, focusing on a motel conversion up in Shasta County. Trust me, some of these counties have not been part of our efforts of support in the past to support homeless efforts at Shasta County, uh, a new shared housing model, innovative model. The city of Ventura, they're renovating apartments, some large projects in San Francisco, uh, San Diego, you can see some 336 units are being advanced and talking to uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas, the co-chair along with Daryl Steinberg of our uh, Homelessness Task Force. They have five motel acquisitions that they are poised to make, uh, some 430 units made available like that. And by the way, the cost of these programs, negligible compared to the cost of some other programs. So we believe these dollars will not only leverage other resources at the county, uh, and federal level, but also private sector support and based upon our commitment to bring down the cost per unit to an average of less than $130,000. Original goal about $150,000, but we're currently averaging $130,000 a unit. We think we can do more uh, than even our original ambitious goals. Santa Clara uh, has some move-in ready uh, units they'll be advancing in the city of Sacramento. Daryl Steinberg, thank you uh, for one of his projects that he's been most enthusiastic about financing and with this uh, second tranche of award money, that 124 unit hotel conversion uh, will soon be underway. Speaking of things that are underway, uh, the uh, work we have uh, to do is self-evident as it relates to unemployment and PUA uh, support for those that are trying to navigate our unemployment and pandemic uh, unemployment assistance system here in the state of California. Uh, this system is an old, well, 30 plus year old technological system. Uh, for those uh, that uh, understand a little bit about technology, these are the old cobalt systems, these legendary cobalt systems uh, that need to be upgraded, frankly, need to just simply uh, be strewn to the waste bin of history. Uh, but nonetheless, we inherited a little bit of that waste bin, and as a consequence, we've been trying to patch it together, and we recognize uh, that we can plot along in the short run, we can plot along in the medium run, we can have a long-term strategy, or we uh, can come up 
uh, with new ideas from a different angle. We put together a strike team led by uh, Yolanda Richardson, who will be up here in a moment, and uh, by uh, one of, uh, well, I would argue, one of the most impactful uh, technologists of sort, and someone who started Code for America uh, and worked in the Obama administration, uh, Jen Polka, to provide us uh, input from a private sector perspective and looking not just at technology, look at business process improvements and looking at new strategies. They co-chaired a task force and they came up with a series of recommendations that already we have put into place. I mentioned last week that uh, we anticipated the fruits of this report, which, by the way, are not just a strike team report. They're also a consultant that we hired, a report from a consultant, and a response back from EDD. I made it clear that when that report was done, we would make it public, uh, and we worked through the weekend to do just that. It uh, came out late on Saturday night, but we said we were going to move forward provide that information in a transparent way. We've done that, and as a consequence, the reset started this weekend. I didn't want to wait another day uh, to start this reset period uh, to get this uh, system back on its feet and get us to a position uh, where we can address this significant number of backlog cases. By the way, in the report, it's remarkable, showed uh, an independent review that showed our system uh, as challenged as it's been is actually performing much better than the vast majority of states. Um, dare I say uh, that as a nation, we have a huge IT problem. As a nation, we must do what California and I would argue municipalities must do, and that is completely reimagine our approach uh, to uh, large-scale IT procurement. Uh, the fact that we have been consistently one of the top ten states in terms of percentage of people uh, that have filed and received uh, checks now 14th uh, by one analysis uh, suggests how low the bar is in terms of our systems across this nation. And so I'm not here to compare and contrast. I'm here just to give you a sense of what governors, what uh, state legislatures all across this country are facing in terms of this historic uh, number of cases that we have to adjudicate. And I say adjudicate because we're adjudicating fraud. We've had fraud schemes all across the United States of America, disproportionately hitting states that have no income taxes for various reasons that become very obvious on the verification side uh, when you consider. Uh, we are not immune from those fraud uh, efforts, and we are making real progress uh, to weed them out and hold individuals and organized groups accountable. But one of the most important things we can do and what we're doing as part of this two-week reset is implementing a new automatic ID verification software system. We went through about 16 or so uh, vendors looking at what uh, was available out there and went down to about 12 where we really tested and kicked the proverbial tires. And we've come up with a system called ID.me. This will process about 90 percent automatically of all of the new applications. Uh, you'll have requirements under this automated IT, uh, system, IT system, to do selfies, to provide additional verification in ways that we think could substantially, not exclusively, no one's naive, but substantially mitigate fraud. Uh, we are now aware of five states that are in the process of, uh, of utilizing similar technology. We we're comparing to capacity, and I think Texas soon will be doing the same, though I don't want to speak for them. But we've been able to share best practices. We've been able to talk to our colleagues all across this country, not just governors, but uh, our strike team looked at those best practices in terms of verification software. And that's the one we've landed on, and we're moving quickly. Also, are looking at business process improvements, not just IT improvements, taking some of our most senior staff members that have been working the phones and now using the more senior staff members with their unique insight and expertise to go after the most complex and the oldest cases uh, that are the most stubborn and I know frustrating for many of you trying to navigate this system. We're also focusing uh, on our email backlogs and mail backlogs and aggressing more aggressive strategy on outbound call effort, not just reacting, but being more proactive in adjudicating claims and moving claim processing forward. 
The goal is self-evident, to reduce that backlog, reduce at the moment the growth of that backlog. Again, we say short-term, medium, and long-term. Uh, we believe this two-week reset will do just that. We're also making available uh, more ability to download forms and information using your mobile devices and having better uh, and easier information uh, available on your mobile devices as well. We want to meet people where they are, and that means meeting them on their smartphones and providing that information uh, in a much more expedited uh, manner with more clarity uh, and with more focus on what the real needs are. So that was all part of parcel of the strike team report and this consultant report. Um, and I should just say, and I'm going to ask Yolanda to come up here in a moment, uh, that the reset does not mean that those of you that are now for the first time applying for benefits will be impacted in terms of those benefits being provided. Quite the contrary. We believe this will fast track the likelihood that you would otherwise gone into a manual process that could take upwards of 60 days. Unacceptable. And so we believe, and Yolanda will talk in a moment, uh, that this reset uh, will make not only this process better in the medium and long term, but begin to substantially address the backlog over the next 90 to 100 days with the goal to substantially have addressed it uh, and not impact any people that are applying for the first time in terms of the timeliness to a check. And so it's in that spirit. Uh, with that consideration in terms of, uh, uh, of, of the ambiguity, perhaps, in some of the reporting uh, about what a reset actually means to new applicants, that I would love uh, co-chair of our task force, Secretary Richardson, to come up and, and talk a little bit more about her team's efforts, her recommendations, and what her expectations are moving forward with this system. Appreciate that, Governor. Um, on behalf of the strike team, um, my wonderful co-leader, Jen Palka, we really want to thank the governor uh, for the opportunity to go into EDD and bring a fresh perspective um, on their operations and to build on the efforts to design a faster and better experience for the hundreds of thousands of deserving UI claimants across the state. Um, the governor could not have said it better. Um, our charge was clear. Uh, we were to go in and look for how we can ensure that claimants can have the experience that they deserve. And so our report, which we have provided to EDD, is over 70 recommendations, specifically focused on doing, doing a number of things. One, definitely reducing and preventing the growth backlog. And we just, at this time, want to really applaud EDD for embracing the idea of the reset which will allow for those people that the governor mentioned, 40% of UI claimants were going into a manual process. And by embracing this reset, we are giving them a 90% chance going forward of having a much faster experience. This is about getting a check in their hand much faster, and we really appreciate that. Our recommendations were across the board, definitely looking at their processes, uh, looking at redesigning the experience. And so we believe that if EDD embraces our recommendations, they will be well on their path to creating a first-class user experience, minimizing processing delays, being able to open the mail, being able to answer calls. And so we really appreciate, again, their embracement of our recommendations, but most importantly, uh, the Government Operations Agency, in partnership with the California Department of Technology and the Office of Digital in Information, is looking forward to supporting them on their journey to creating that first-class user experience. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And of course, here to answer any questions on this topic as well. But first, I know there may have been a little bit of focus last night on the Emmys. Uh, I was a little bit more focused on Oscar, uh, and that is one of the characters of Sesame Street last night. Uh, and I wanted to share with you uh, that focus and share with you a new PSA uh, that we partnered with the Skoll Foundation on in the state of California uh, to announce. Uh, and no further ado, uh, let's Tune in uh, to America's most grouchy, Oscar. Oscar the Grouch here to tell you 
Yeah, you. To wear a mask when you're out in public around other people. It isn't difficult. Even a three-year-old can do it. Oh, hi, everybody. Sure, it'll keep you and others healthy, but more importantly, I won't have to see your happy, smiling face. And I can make grouchy faces at you without you knowing. <laughs> Another benefit. So, if you don't want to wear a mask, I've got just one thing to tell you. Scram! Go away! <sighs> Caring for each other because we are all in this together. So wear a mask and have a rotten day, will ya? <sighs>
where we can um, make sure they go through an automated process versus having to kick out into a manual one. Uh, that will allow them to get paid uh, even sooner if they're eligible, which is excellent. In the meantime, um, we will be focusing all of our, um, um, redirecting all of our high skilled folks to really drill down on the ex um, more complex cases. So um, for the backlog that we're experiencing right now, um, we predict between now and the end of Jul um, January will be completed. But we're making huge progress each and every day. It doesn't mean that in January that's what people have to wait. We will be clearing backlog every single day between now and January. Um, and it's just allowed us the ability to really focus, um, as well as additional tools that uh, the strike team brought, uh, will allow us to um, uh, implement a very good way to manage our resources, to make sure we're focused on the backlog and we have the right people addressing everything at the right time. So we, I can't be more thrilled. And again, I want to say thank you so much to the administration and Yolanda Richardson, um, Secretary Richardson, for her support and all their great work. They were tr truly tremendous. So. Thank you, and, and thank you, Director. And just as a reminder, the, there's a three-week timeline that's traditionally been the case for new applications, and we believe uh, as it relates to uh, those that are applying that can still fill out forms, uh, and we will be proactively calling to engage them once this reset is concluded. By the way, the reset process ends on October 5th. We started that process this weekend. We didn't want to delay it uh, even a day. Uh, but that three-week uh, process within that three-week is the goal, and we anticipate and expect uh, with those new applicants, even within this reset period, that they will receive uh, those checks within that period of time. Michael Finney, ABC7. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Are you really confident that six months of failure and years of mismanagement and neglect can be fixed with a two-week reset? Well, the issue of short-term, medium, and long-term is part and parcel of what we are announcing here today. We conducted a very thorough and very objective process, hiring a consultant, putting together a strike team made up of not just experts within the state, uh, but outside the state. We inherited an old, dilapidated system, not dissimilar to many other states in this country. It's a wake-up call, as I said, for this nation, not just the state of California, to substantially uh, make progress in terms of large-scale IT procurement. Just a brief update uh, on that. Uh, before I got here, when I was Lieutenant Governor, Governor Brown initiated uh, a larger procurement process uh, for unemployment insurance. Uh, as well as other benefits, including disability insurance and paid family leave. Uh, that process uh, is an order of magnitude larger process uh, than the one that we are announcing here today. Uh, that process, uh, we continue to advance, uh, but we're taking advantage of all the contemporary information we have learned over the last six months to make sure uh, that we're not paving over the old cow path that we're not just moving forward with something that made a lot of sense a year ago, but makes no sense based upon the volume and the experience we've had over the last six months. So the answer to your question is, we're making short-term commitments, and we have medium-term strategies, uh, but we're here for the long haul. We're going to get this right. It's not just here with uh, issues of disability insurance. It's not just issues with unemployment insurance. It's across the spectrum, including the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, and in many other areas of government. That's why I created an office of digital innovation, uh, brought to bear some real uh, guidance and expertise by recruiting new team of individuals running these agencies uh, and bringing in some of the private sector mindset uh, that uh, I have found very, very insightful over the course of many, many years. We also started something called the RF2 process, uh, and that is a strategy that moves away from some of the RFI, RFPs, RFQs, uh, the old ways of doing business. If I haven't lost you, you haven't paid much attention, except to say uh, those acronyms, acronyms, well, 
they rely on outdated thinking. So we're trying to bring modern, more innovative thinking into our processes. I, I've been here 20-ish months as your governor, not 20 years, not even two years, and I'm committed over the course of the next two years of my term to really initiate uh, some order of magnitude change in this space. We've seeded a lot in the last year, year and a half, and all of this experience has only doubled uh, my resolve to do more still. Yes, Governor, I wanted to ask a, a fire-related question. Um, Standard & Poor's has been saying that they're not sure that the $21 billion in the wildfire fund set up last year for the utilities will be enough considering the size of the fire season already and the fact that we have at least another month to go. Are you thinking of trying to boost that fund in some way, or is there any effort among the legislators to do it? Not at this moment. You know, we worked over the course of last year to put together a comprehensive strategy in record period of time, but a very thoughtful, judicious process to help uh, support PG&E's emergence from bankruptcy, but as a completely reimagined company with completely new strategies and goals, and more importantly, accountability and transparency, the ability to claw back if they don't meet those goals. Uh, as it relates to the fund itself, uh, we, we believe that fund, which is leveraged beyond the $21 billion, uh, is substantial, uh, but we're not naive uh, to the magnitude of this year's fire season, uh, which, as you know, is historic, simply is not without precedent or is without precedent. 3.6 million acres, uh, less than 300,000 the entire calendar year last year. So I certainly recognize the anxiety uh, around the size of the fund, but at the moment, uh, the answer is no. Uh, but again, uh, we're not ideologues. We're not wedded uh, to the status quo. As conditions change, uh, as uh, some areas, concerns develop and present themselves, uh, even beyond this S&P's assessment, uh, we certainly will assess uh, the condition of that fund uh, and our capacity uh, as a state uh, to support uh, not only the IOUs, uh, but more broadly, the CCAs and all of the others that are responsible uh, for the procurement and distribution and the reliability of energy here in the state of California. Paul Rogers, Mercury News. Uh, hi, Governor. Uh, last week you said uh, you wanted to increase California's actions to address climate change in the wake of these record uh, wildfires. Um, I understand you're considering an executive order. Um, what types of measures are you considering? Uh, you know, for example, there are nearly a dozen countries, including England, Germany, Israel, and India, uh, who have announced that they'll ban the sale of uh, new vehicles with internal combustion engines uh, in 2030. Uh, is that something you'll direct the State Air Resources Board to follow, or, or where's your thinking on what we need to do uh, new? We'll be making announcements uh, in due course, and so um, look forward to not just making announcements uh, this week, next week, but over the course of many, many months. Uh, we are committed to uh, exercising appropriately uh, our resolve to do more uh, than we even have to date in terms of low carbon green growth and to begin the process of changing the way we produce and consume energy, uh, both supply but primarily demand approach. And that's consistent with the frame of your question. By the way, it's also consistent with the frame uh, of the actions that were recently taken by this state that didn't generate the kind of attention perhaps uh, that they, they deserved, and that is the fact that California is lead, leading the nation just recently adopted strategies on medium and heavy-duty trucks uh, to reduce emissions in that space. And we followed up. We now have 15 states that have joined this uh, partnership. We were the first state to do that. Uh, and we are committed uh, to finding more uh, support from other states across this nation. So uh, we look forward to working with the legislature uh, next year, a series of efforts. We look forward to continuing uh, at the administrative uh, level to do more in this space and certainly all of our regulatory agencies to continue to advance the collective goal of decarbonizing our economy, which is our commitment and our resolve in this state. Hi, Governor. Thank you for taking my questions. Always appreciated. Um, there's been con some concern among labor leaders down here in Orange County, at least, and I'm sure other parts of California, about whether you will sign into law AB 3216, the labor retention law put forward by Ash Calra in response to the coronavirus era unemployment um, amid opposition by
for-profit industries objecting to this bill. What do you say to those concerns? Will you sign this bill? And also, amid the conversation on wildfires and climate change, there's another aspect of environmental justice slipping by, namely the topic of seawater desalination facilities. Here in Huntington Beach, this controversial desalination project proposal for the coastline that critics fear would negatively impact low-income communities and palpable concern among activists that uh, Governor, you won't reappoint to the Santa Ana Water Board a key vocal critic of the project proposal, Director William von Blockengame, amid a pending vote on the project's permit. Would you say those concerns are valid, and will you appoint um, Director von Blasen, reappoint Director von Blasengame to the board? Well, thank you. Uh, and, and forgive me, I, first of all, thank you for the uh, details of your question, and, and let me, uh, and I don't mean this to be flippant or dismissive, quite the contrary. Um, as many of you know, uh, I have quite literally hundreds of bills uh, that I am currently uh, going through uh, in real detail and specificity. I have till the end of this month, just nine or so days, uh, to make a determination to sign or veto hundreds and hundreds of bills. Uh, we tend not to, uh, as a rule, um, uh, unless there is some extenuating circumstance uh, preview uh, where we land on many of these bills. And so I look forward to reviewing the specific bill uh, that you have in question. And we'll certainly, as we process that, once we sign or veto that bill, we'll make sure uh, that you are made aware of that decision. As it relates to the decision, as it relates to personnel, try not to uh, make decisions about appointments or reappointments. Um, uh, particularly uh, on regional bodies, and water boards, and air quality districts and the like uh, in, in, in a public manner like this. And forgive me, uh, we have not had the opportunity with my appointment secretary uh, to adjudicate uh, the uh, quality uh, of those existing appointees, uh, many that I inherited from the Brown administration, many outstanding, uh, and we'll certainly, again, as we make those determinations, make those public. Thank you, Governor. Uh, one of the Orange County Board of Supervisors uh, members is asking President Trump to give coronavirus relief funding directly to the counties and not to the state in order to take away some of your own leverage. What's your response to that? And what's your response to the broader question about the power of the states versus the counties when it comes to dealing with coronavirus? Well, there was something that happened uh, many, many moons ago. Founding fathers created a constitution, created a framework of federalism, states' rights. Uh, it's enshrined in the constitution. I would encourage uh, anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to dust up on some of these constitutional principles to consider uh, these requests in light of uh, how this nation was founded and the framework uh, that has lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. And, uh, and so, with respect, uh, I defer out of the wisdom of our founding fathers. John Myers, LA Times. Yeah, Governor, I want to get back to the EDD problems in particular. I mean, the task force had a, an eye-popping number on Saturday night saying that the backlog is growing by some 10,000 cases a day. I just want to know from you, I mean, how can Californians trust that this is going to get fixed and that the numbers you're talking about now, your projections are going to be right? I mean, can you give them a better metric that you've told your team you want X improvement by the end of September, X by mid-October? I mean, there's some accountability here that people want to know that something's getting done. Yeah, that's why we put together strike teams, why I brought five new people uh, into this agency. That's why we hired an independent consultant. That's why we put the consultant report out at the same time we put the strike team report out. It's why we had EDD respond in kind, uh, and it's why we moved forward over the weekend so we didn't waste even a day in terms of our assurance to move forward with a reset. So all I can say is that and more, that we are committed uh, to everything that we have asserted in the EDD response letter, uh, and we are committed to work in a collaborative spirit, oversight, California legislature. Uh, we had the opportunity. They have uh, a work group that we had counseled with. They actually provided some very uh, in, insightful uh, um, recommendations of their own, and we're trying to incorporate the same. And so uh, we are committed uh, to getting this done, uh, and we recognize the magnitude of the responsibility and the extraordinary challenge uh, that we uh, have uh, in front of us. And so uh, we'll be transparent with you and others in real time over the course of weeks, uh, not waiting months uh, for the results 
of these efforts, and that's another firm commitment uh, that the team is also advancing. Final question, Dustin Gardner, SF Chronicle. Thank you, Governor. Um, with respect to zero emissions vehicles and climate change, uh, your administration has moved in the last year to cut rebates for electric vehicles. Even before the pandemic, your budget cut funding in about half. And this was as the state had a surplus. Now it looks like there could be almost no funding for rebates this year or very little funding. Why are rebates not a key piece of your strategy when it comes to the transition to electric vehicles? We're committed to rebates. We're committed to a, a completely comprehensive strategy from healthy soils to doing what we can in regenerative agriculture strategies on supply, strategies on demand, committed to the broader cause of environmental justice, energy efficiency in the state of California, and making sure communities that have been left out uh, are part and parcel of the narrative moving forward in terms of our decarbonization efforts. There's an enormous amount of pressure, as you know well, imagine you've reported in terms of the cap and trade program uh, and the auction results, though we had much more favorable auction results recently. Working with the legislature, we have uh, committed to a process uh, very shortly uh, to advance those efforts, and I certainly am committed to advancing the efforts uh, on electric vehicles. Uh, you may not be familiar, uh, but I was very proud of the work I did as a county supervisor, as mayor, uh, where we took uh, international leadership, not just national and statewide leadership, uh, during my tenure uh, in those respective roles on electric vehicles. I am committed to doing the same as governor of California. We're very proud of the work we just did on medium and heavy-duty truck, a disproportionate number uh, of, well, disproportionate amount of greenhouse gas emissions emanating from a relatively small number of those vehicles. We think uh, that was a substantially significant effort uh, in reducing emissions and one we hope will be replicated even beyond the 15 states that have committed to that cause. You'll be hearing more about our efforts uh, as it relates to electric vehicles in the coming uh, weeks and months, and you'll certainly uh, be learning more uh, as we're already in the process of putting together next year's budget uh, when I announce uh, those efforts in January. And so with that, let me thank everybody for the opportunity to update you on some of the announcements we made over the weekend. EDD, thank you as well uh, to our entire team, particularly Department of Public Health. It is nice to see a 2.8 percent positivity rate uh, for the first time in many, many months over a seven-day period. It's nice to see those test numbers begin to increase, again, not where we need to see either number. Uh, look forward tomorrow to hearing Dr. Galley update us on our tiered status. Uh, and again, we thank our partners at Sesame Street uh, and Oscar uh, for his contributions today, uh, reminding all of us the importance, power, and potency of wearing face covering, wearing a mask. Take care, everybody.